on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Boots on the ground in Lebanon as the IDF pushes Hezbollah away from Israel's border. And a look at the deep tunnels troops will encounter there. Plus, the genius of Israel. CBN's new documentary exploring the strengths of Israeli culture and how it dodges some of the problems plaguing other countries. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the world is waking up to a new reality in the Middle East. Days after the elimination of Hezbollah leader it's also carrying out long-range strikes against the Houthis in Yemen. After eliminating Nasrallah and most of the Hezbollah leadership, Israeli jets continue targeting the remaining leaders, including a strike deep into the heart of Beirut early Monday. Netanyahu says Israel will continue attacking the terror group and taking on other threats in the region. We're changing the strategic reality in the Middle East. Changing the balance of power brings with it the possibility of creating new alliances in our region because of a simple reason, because we're winning. Our enemies and our friends return to see Israel as it really is, a strong country, a determined country, a powerful country. Netanyahu explained why Israel targeted the Hezbollah leader. Nasrallah was not another terrorist. He was the terrorist. He was the axis of the axis, the central engine of Iran's axis of evil. He and his people were the architects of the plan to destroy Israel. Islamic jihadists and their allies are mourning Nasrallah's death and swearing revenge. In the Iranian parliament and on the streets of Tehran, shouts of death to Israel rang out. We want retaliation, a quick retaliation. We will definitely take revenge for Hassan Nasrallah's death. Throughout Israel and even other parts of the Middle East, many celebrated. Israelis danced in Demona, and Syrian rebels, who've long been targeted by Hezbollah in Syria, set off fireworks and celebrated. Israel is also carrying out powerful attacks on the Houthis in Yemen. After they tried to hit Ben Gurion Airport this past weekend, as Netanyahu returned from addressing the United Nations. In a veiled threat to Iran, the Israeli military chief of staff says the Jewish state can reach any enemy, no matter how distant. We know how to reach very far. We know how to reach even farther. And we know how to strike there with precision. In the U.S., the Biden administration is still calling on Israel to put the brakes on in Lebanon to avoid all-out war. Can an all-out war in the Middle East be avoided? It has to do. We, uh, we really have to avoid this. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo disagrees. We should be saying plain and clear, finish the job. Uh, Nasrallah would be alive today if the Biden administration ceasefire had gone into effect. The entire Hezbollah leadership would be alive today if the Israelis had agreed to the ceasefire. The IDF's long-anticipated ground incursion into southern Lebanon began Monday night. The operations are the latest step to free southern Lebanon from Hezbollah and allow Israeli residents of the north to return to their homes after nearly a year of daily rocket attacks. Take a look. IDF troops headed into southern Lebanon Monday, launching localized and limited raids against Hezbollah terror targets that pose the most imminent threat to nearby Israeli communities. Explosions lit up the night sky as the IDF attacked. Hezbollah turned Lebanese villages next to Israeli villages into military bases, all ready for an attack on Israel. Hezbollah had prepared to use those villages as staging grounds for an October 7th style invasion into Israeli homes. The IDF's chief spokesman explained the reason for the invasion. If the state of Lebanon and the world can't push Hezbollah away from our border, we have no choice but to do it ourselves. I want to make it clear. Our war is with Hezbollah, not with the people of Lebanon. Israeli jets are bombing Hezbollah targets throughout Lebanon, including Beirut, where the terror group is headquartered. President Biden told reporters he wants the fighting to stop. We should have a ceasefire now. Thank you. 
The State Department is pressing for a ceasefire, but acknowledged Hezbollah is to blame for this war, and Israel has a right to end it decisively. It was Hezbollah on the day after October 7th that started launching rocket attacks across the border that had not stopped until this day, and Israel has a right to defend itself against those attacks. So far, Iran is not coming to the aid of their number one proxy in the region. Observers like former Trump official Jared Kushner believe it's a sign that the regime in Tehran is more vulnerable with Hezbollah weakened. On Monday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu delivered a message directly to the Iranian people. When Iran is finally free, and that moment will come a lot sooner than people think, Everything will be different. Our two ancient peoples, the Jewish people and the Persian people, will finally be at peace. Iran will thrive as never before. Global investment, massive tourism, brilliant technological innovation based on the tremendous talents that exist inside Iran. Doesn't that sound better than endless poverty, repression and war? Don't let a small group of fanatic theocrats crush your hopes and your dreams. Iranian-born Ramin Parsa told CBN News most Iranians detest the Islamic regime. I can tell you with certainty that 95 percent of the people in Iran, they don't want the Islamic regime. The regime basically has no uh, support from within from the people. If, if you remember uh, on April 13 when the regime attacked Israel, the first thing that the regime did, they, they put anti-riot uh, forces on the streets because they were more afraid of the people rising up than even Israel attacking back. So that's why they were so scared. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. As Israel continues pushing back Hezbollah in Lebanon, they'll be encountering tunnels just like in Gaza. But these tunnels are deeper and required blasting through bedrock. This next piece from a few years ago shows the underground network Hezbollah made for moving troops, kidnapping victims, and rearming. This is Zarit, a small agricultural community of 250 residents on the Israel-Lebanon border. Above ground, it's quiet and peaceful, but underground, Hezbollah was planning for death and destruction. We're standing in the tunnel right now and just a few feet from the Lebanese border. This tunnel is called Ramia, named after the village where the tunnel began. It was the most difficult for the IDF to discover. It's also the longest and the deepest, the equivalent of a 22-story building built underground. You can see the wind chair on the wall over there, electricity, communications, lighting, and there's a phone that was actually connected for the first day when we exposed the tunnel. The wire was still live. One of our guys jokingly picked it up and asked for anybody to answer on the other side. There was no answer. The workmanship you see here is all done by Hezbollah. This tunnel took years to construct and millions of dollars to build, much of it supplied by Iran. You can see the remains of a rail system that Hezbollah had in place, which is what they used in order to bring equipment up, basically, and also to take all of the debris and rocks and shift it out of the tunnel. This would attach to a, a an, an electric drill, power drill, that would drill like this and once it got to the end of the of the of the of the cup itself they would just pull it out is impressive it's large enough where hundreds of hezbollah commandos could have come into israel with a goal to kidnap or kill where we're standing now you can see behind me is the last and the highest point that this hezbollah tunnel got as you can see it's only a few meters from ground level. This is the entrance Israel opened into the tunnel. IDF spokesman Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Conricus told us the tunnel runs almost a mile long and was nearly operational. Operational in the sense of Hezbollah actually having the ability to break out and then to run to the nearest Israeli community. There are two communities here nearby, less than six minutes running distance from where we are now. Tunnel warfare expert Daphne Richmond Barak says the value of this type of warfare is priceless for Hezbollah. The potential reward is, is a major one if only it succeeds because um, it neutralizes the, uh, so the, the te technological advantage of the Israeli army. For now, Conricus believes they have found and rendered all the border tunnels useless, either by destroying or filling them with cement. That doesn't mean that we have, even for one second, let down our guard and have stopped looking. 
In the meantime, this massive tunnel represents the persistent determination of Hezbollah to destroy Israel and the IDF's vigilance to stop one of Israel's greatest enemies. Coming up, how Jewish culture has thrived throughout the millennia and what are some of the secrets of the genius of Israel. CBN's new documentary looks at one of the marvels of human history, how the Jewish people have survived for thousands of years. It's called The Genius of Israel, and director Aaron Zimmerman told us more about it. Aaron Zimmerman, great to be with you. You've got a film called The Genius of Israel. Uh, tell us about it. Uh, well, it's based on a book called The Genius of Israel by the great Dan Sinor and Saul Singer. They wrote a book last year, before the war in Israel, by the way, and they had this question. Why are Israelis so happy? Because last year, you know, every year the UN puts out this mm -hmm. World Happiness Report, and usually it's all the Scandinavian countries are at the top. But last year they got a surprise. Number four was Israel, surrounded by terrorists, um, surrounded by enemy nations. Okay, what's the deal with this? Why are they so happy? And so this book and this film examines exactly why that is. What are some of the secrets to the genius of Israel? Okay, well, one of them is the community. And, and one of them, it's, it's sort of all the things that we're throwing away in Western society. You know, we're saying now, oh, we don't need the family. We don't need a mother, father, children. We don't need all of this community. We're good on our own. You know, America, you're individualistic. You do things on your own. And that's the exact opposite because Israel Israel has the lowest, um, lowest drug overdose, lowest suicide, lowest alcohol consumption. They're the youngest country having the most children of all the wealthy nations in the world. And so that community is what is giving them the hope and the happiness. And when we say happiness, let me say, it's not just sort of like rah, rah, cheerful happiness. This is, the, the questions are based on deep life satisfaction. And so Israelis, they say, you know, every Friday you have Shabbat, even whether you're religious or not. And you don't just go see your parents, maybe. You go see grandparents, you see aunts and uncles and cousins. And there's this deep family tie so that you're not alone, you're always in a community. So you have that, your schools are very community-based. They have strong scout movements for children here that are very community-based. You go into the army and you're part of that. So you're always part of your family, you're part of your country, you're part of your the rest of your society. Um, no one's left out in the cold and that's a very different picture from what we have in Western countries. Mm. How does God fit into this in their faith? It's really interesting. Um, I asked them that and I, there wasn't so much a difference. Of course, God is in the center of it all, I believe. And I think God has kept the Jewish people through many generations. You know, they say in the Passover, every generation a Haman rises up to kill us, depending on, you know, who, whoever that is this time, this, this year it's Hamas. God is at the center of that. He's the one keeping them. Yes, are they independent and, and defending themselves and do they have resilience? Absolutely. They wouldn't do it without God bringing back the Jewish people through 2,000 years of horror and Holocaust and war and you name it. So he's at the center of it, whether people want to say that or not. But I found the tradition level is about the same with religious and non-religious. The non-religious will still go home every week because if they don't, their parents will yell at them. You know, <laughs> you better be here for Shabbat. <laughs> what do you want people to get out of this film? There is so much anti-Semitism all over today, and I, I hate to see it. I hate to see the media. I hate to see the UN. Everybody's pounding Israel and saying, look, they're an apartheid state. They're causing a genocide in Gaza. It's simply not true. I want people to see what an amazing country Israel is. And whether you disagree with their government or not, whether you disagree with this war or not, you need to see the human side. You need to see these people are full of love and compassion and community. You know what really struck me here was when the hostage were taken. People here felt that as deeply as if they had been their own children. The majority of the state of Israel doesn't know these hostages, and yet they feel it so deeply. They cry. I've seen them crying, looking at the memorial, saying, we have to get these home, marching for them. Now that for me is foreign. I don't see that level of care in the West for somebody you don't even know. But there's an extremely unified population here and they're all everything is about charity and love and, and doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. You know, it's the golden rule. Yeah. We can take a lot from that. Yeah.
Well, I've seen that too. If anything you learn about Israel after being here is that they were family. So that's how they identify with our sausages. And it's a great story that needs to be told. Aaron, thanks so much for the film. We look forward to seeing it soon. Thanks, Chris. Up next, the psychological ravages of war. How one Israeli doctor discovered a technique to stabilize victims quickly. Tikkun Olam, the Jewish idea of making the world a better place, is one of the themes in the documentary we just heard about, The Genius of Israel. The Israeli psychiatrist in our next piece embodies that concept with his innovative treatment for post-traumatic stress. Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl has the story. After the October 7th massacre and a year of war, almost every Israeli household feels the stress of having family members and friends fighting in a conflict with no end in sight. Anytime anybody turns on the television, um, people are traumatized because the, the length of the war, there are soldiers that unfortunately are dying all the time. Dr. Gary Quinn leads the Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing Institute in Jerusalem. EMDR is one of the main ways therapists treat trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. Quinn says October 7th and its ongoing impact led to a unique situation situation affecting the entire nation. These traumas of life and death, of horrific scenes, it's the kind of atrocities that one would hear about that one person went through. And here we had thousands of people that were going through. For years, Dr. Quinn has helped terror victims and those traumatized by war. Treatment typically begins days following the event, so he pursued an idea for something that could be done immediately. The ISP idea I came up with at a point when nobody was saying you do anything with people in the immediate aftermath of trauma. Quinn explains that this immediate stabilization procedure, or IPS, begins by tapping one's own arms or shoulders or the table while focusing on the fact that they are now safe. That is important because it means that it does not need to be done by a psychologist or a mental health professional but can also be done by first responders or other people. He tells CBN News the key is quickly bringing people out of a very high level of distress. It has helped people who have been in the, the war and the soldiers that are coming off the lines and they're in frozen terror. And with a combination of bilateral stimulation, something of this nature, helps people then to realize or come back to the present awareness of safety in a relatively quick amount of time. At the beginning of the Ukraine war, Dr. Quinn volunteered to train therapists to use it, then saw they first needed help themselves. Because all of the therapists themselves were at a very high level of stress because of the war. Uh, we rate the stress level from zero to 10, and they could be either six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, and had to do the uh, ISP first to calm them down. This led to what he calls an incredible collaboration organized by Regent University and CBN Israel to modify the method. It ends up being that the product came back in a better condition, much more streamlined and much more effective and efficient in helping people. Quinn feels encouraged with Israel's progress in recovering over the past year. What I see is the raising of despair to hope, the transforming from individual and national tragedy to resilience and post-traumatic growth. And I'm only seeing heroes and people dealing with everything. He says Israel's enemies thought launching missiles would break morale here, although Quinn believes it's made the country more resilient. The people all care about people. There is not anyone that is not volunteering at doing something. And I think that this level of caring of the community is one of the key elements that is so much allowing for the kind of resilience for people to recover. And that experience has led the doctor to give credit to God. And if I had not been religious beforehand, boy, I am now religious. This is clearly 
God's hand, mm -hmm. taking the most awful of horrible experiences and having people transform it. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Kfar Maccabea, and Jerusalem, Israel. Still ahead, voices of courage and hope in the Bridges of Peace video series, Israel Unfiltered. Bridging the gap between Christians and Jews, that's one of the goals of Bridges for Peace. They also have an online series called Israel Unfiltered. Ilse Strauss stopped by recently to tell us about a way to watch the series for free for the first 10 days in October in honor of October 7th. Ilse Strauss from uh, Bridges for Peace, thanks so much for joining us. You've just done a 10-part series, video series, called mm -hmm. Israel Unfiltered. Tell us about it. Indeed. Well, Chris, it was born right after October 7th when we received so many phone calls from Christians around the world saying, we stand with Israel, we love Israel, but what do we say to accusations from colleagues, from, from, from friends in the church, from, from my family? Accusations that say Israel is committing genocide, Israel bombs schools, Israel had this coming, um, Israel should have expected this, Israel is an oppressor. How do I answer this factually? And obviously all the information is out there, but everyone is busy. So we decided let's do everything together in a one-stop shop. So we did a series to answer every question that you might have about October 7th and the ensuing war. Wow. And so tell us, what are we going to be seeing in this 10-part series and who are you going to be talking to? Well, we did interviews with 10 experts, historical experts, military experts, Arab Israelis, Christians, everyone who can give the background, the history of this piece of land that is perpetually in the news. Who owns it? Where do we start counting? Um, how does the Israeli army fight? Are they the most moral army in the world or baby killers? Hamas, how do they fight? What is their strategy? Then we speak to Itamar Marcus, for instance, about um, Western mindset as opposed to radical Islamist mindset. And that's a very big disconnect because we think in our Western mindset, I want my children to grow up, be happy, follow the Lord. That's not the way in a radical mindset. We speak to former Colonel Richard Kemp to unpack the military history and the strategy behind this. We speak to an Arab Israeli who served in the IDF by the name of Yahya Mahamid. We speak to a Palestinian human rights activist by the name of Bassam Eid. So everyone has a unique perspective on this, this war that is perpetually on the news, in social media, and the truth is being established on social media yeah. these days. With about a minute left, uh, why so important now? Truth is being established on social media. There's no way to fact check that. This you need to have an opinion about. Christians need to have an opinion about Israel. Your opinion needs to be based on fact. So make sure it is. This cuts through the propaganda. And this is all part of the mission statement of Bridges for Peace, really, to stand with Israel. Yes, Christians and Jews standing together, Christian building bridges with Jews in Israel and around the world. And I know there's a very special offer you have right now, and people can go to israelunfiltered.tv slash free dash access. I'll say that one more time. Israelunfiltered.tv slash free dash access and people can get it for free. Is that right? Correct. All 10 interviews, limited access though. So please watch it now. Well, it sounds like a wonderful series and uh, Ilsa Strauss, great to be with you and I uh, look forward to the series and uh, Kola Kavod as they say. Thank you, Chris. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. And please continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and Israel and for the safety of IDF soldiers and all those in harm's way and for the return of all the hostages. For all of us here at the Jerusalem Bureau, we'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.